Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 32 years we have invited voices of conscience to explore the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Mark Tursik is president and CEO of the Nature Conservancy, the world's leading conservation organization, committed to, quote, conserving critical lands, restoring the world's oceans, securing fresh water, and reducing the impact of climate change, quote. Before joining the Nature Conservancy, Mark Tursik was a managing director at Goldman Sachs, heading the firm's environmental strategy group and Center for Environmental Markets, which promoted market-based solutions to environmental challenges. He serves on numerous boards and councils, including Resources for the Future, the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, and the Commission on Climate and Tropical Forests. A graduate of Williams College and Harvard University, he's the author of the new book, Nature's Fortune, How Business and Society Thrive by Investing in Nature. In his presentation today, Why Saving Nature is the Smartest Investment We Can Make, he will argue that viewing nature as our green infrastructure allows for breakthroughs not only in conservation but in economic progress. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Mark Tursik. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, for that nice introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It's uh, an honor to be your speaker today in this especially beautiful setting. Um, I'm here to talk about my, my new book, and um, I opened the book with a reflection on my background. Uh, when I was appointed CEO of the Nature Conservancy, of course, I was very excited. But a lot of people, including my colleagues at the Nature Conservancy, seemed to think my background as an investment banker from Wall Street was a strange background to bring to the world of nature conservation. And to be honest, when I got started, I began to wonder myself. I remember one episode in particular, and I opened the book with this. I was at a, a, a fancy um, reception in Washington, D.C. It was the early days in the job for me. And it was a who's who, really, of the environmental uh, movement. Uh, people from Capitol Hill were there, prominent people. Uh, the environmental organization leaders were all there. Important funders were there. And I really was feeling like, gosh, my background was a little bit at odds with the background everyone else brought to this occasion, and I was feeling a little bit nervous. And then one individual in particular caught my attention, an elderly gentleman, fit and fiddle, but in his 90s, and he just kind of had an aura about him of authority and expertise and respect. And it dawned on me it must have been Russell Train. Now, you may not all know who Russell Train is, but Russell Train was a giant in our field. And Mr. Train pa passed away about one year ago. But Mr. Train was the um, first chairman of the President's Council on Environmental Quality. He was the second administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. He was a founder of the, World, uh, the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund. He was a giant in our field. So I thought I better go over and introduce myself. So I went over, said hello. And when he understood who I was and, and what my background was, he took a look at me and he said, rather gruffly, but not unkindly, how the hell did you get from Wall Street to leading TNC? <laughs> I kind of fumbled for a good answer, to be honest, at the time. Um, I just wasn't very fast in my feet. But that's what I address in the book, and that's what I want to talk about with you a little bit today. Because, in fact, I think the environmental movement can benefit from folks with different backgrounds and different perspectives and different approaches going forward. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about. Now, I come to this speech today, and I come to my job at the Nature Conservancy rather humbly with regard to the environmental movement. I promise you I couldn't have more respect for the great environmental organizations uh, that are so important. Uh, to our life today. Uh, and I have great respect for the great champions of these organizations. Take the Nature Conservancy, for example, but just one example. 
The Nature Conservancy, you know, it, it's extraordinary. It now has more than 60 years of experience. It has 4,000 people on its team. We operate in every state in the U.S. and in additional 35 countries. We have real global reach. We have financial resources. We have a million members. We have extraordinarily passionate and generous supporters and volunteer leaders. And we're just one of many great environmental organizations. You could talk about a lot of our peer organizations in the same very respectful way. Great organizations with great histories, well-led, and championed by wonderful, generous supporters. But at TNC, we like to think of ourselves as a science-based organization. And being a science-based organization means really looking very ruthlessly at the facts. And the facts tell us that as a movement, notwithstanding all the good work we're doing, the environmental movement has some room for improvement. We're not fully getting the job done. For example, imagine you had my job, you lead TNC. What do you think the kinds of things you'd be uh, concerned about would be? I mean, there'd be some things that you would like to see more of. Healthy forests, uh, robust fisheries, healthy coral reefs, um, biodiversity itself. I could go on and on. Well, we measure, we measure these matters, and sadly, they're all in decline. Or if you had my job, you might be focused on things we'd like to have less of. One would be greenhouse gas emissions, which we now know causes uh, dangerous climate change. Well, notwithstanding the effort of so many great organizations, uh, we're one of them, we're not really getting the job done there either. We have record, record new levels of greenhouse gas emissions every year. And by the way, when we look ahead, it's not going to get any easier. You all know that the global population will likely grow from about today's 7 billion to something like 9 billion people. More significantly, more significantly from an environmental perspective, the world's middle class is growing. The middle class will grow by several billion people over the next decade, now, or next decades. I happen to think that's a very good thing. The emergence of a bigger middle class, that means people are being lifted out of poverty. That means they'll have better lives for their families, better housing situations, better health care, better nutrition, more access to energy and electricity. These are good things. But as this middle, bigger middle class emerges, that consumption is going to translate to demand for food, energy, space, and water. And a lot of infrastructure is going to go with that. And that's going to be a threat to the objectives of the Nature Conservancy. And if that's not enough, on top of all that, we have to throw climate change into the mix. Again, we're a science-based organization. Climate's already changing. It's going to exacerbate the environmental challenges we face. So somehow, in my view, the environmental movement has to take its game up to another level. That's what we want to do at the Nature Conservancy. I think that's my job. And you know, there's, a lot, there's room for lots of opinions about how best to do this. But one of the concerns I have is sometimes, as environmentalists, we make mistakes. Uh, the environmental movement is, is staffed by and supported by people who love nature. I love nature. I think I owe my kids, and God willing, if I have them grandkids some days, uh, I, we owe them a natural world as robust and as healthy as the one we've enjoyed. But when we talk about nature as something that we love, when we talk about nature on a kind of isn't nature wonderful basis, I think we sometimes turn off big segments of society. We make nature almost sound like a luxury good, something to invest in when you've taken care of everything else, something for wealthy people or wealthy societies to care about. In fact, though, I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think economic progress, human well-being, depends vitally on, on nature. In fact, it's poor people who most depend on nature. And so rather than talk about nature exclusively as, isn't nature wonderful, I think we need to talk sometimes more about, isn't nature valuable? And that's the argument I make in my book. I think we should think about nature as a capital. Natural capital is a phrase we use. Or as green infrastructure. So you're all familiar with man-made infrastructure. Well, I think we should view nature as green infrastructure. Why? Because I think this approach will do at least three things for the environmental movement. One, it will allow us to broaden support for protecting nature, broaden support for the environmental movement. We need more people on our side. Second, it will lead to more financial resources for the environmental movement. Protecting nature gets very expensive. 
Heretofore, environmental organizations like the Nature Conservancy have mostly relied on philanthropy. God bless our generous supporters, but we need resources beyond, beyond their capacity. And I'll argue that a natural capital approach can provide us more financial resources. And finally, and maybe most importantly, and I'm only beginning to fully understand this now five years into the job, talking about nature on this kind of basis changes the dialogue between environmentalists and the rest of society. Sometimes we environmentalists make the mistake of kind of lecturing people, hectoring them even, telling them you should do this, you should do that. People don't always want to hear that from us. But on the basis of natural capital, I think we'll shift into a mode of problem solving, of collaboratively figuring out how to make progress and get important things done. But rather than, than wax on and on, let me give you a couple of concrete examples. So I'm going to give you three quick examples. The first one takes place in Quito, Ecuador, the capital city of Ecuador. If you should ever visit the Galapagos, you'll probably fly into Quito. It's a booming city. It's a city that's concerned about how it will secure enough clean water for the citizens of Quito. So a few years ago, the municipal water company of Quito was contemplating investing more in plant and equipment to clean water so that they could be sure the citizens and businesses of Quito would have ample access to clean water. The local Nature Conservancy team showed up and made a very, I think, important and smart argument. My colleagues argued to the water company there's a cheaper way, a less expensive way, to secure the clean water you need. They did not make an environmental argument. They said, you can save money the following way. Instead of building plant and equipment to clean water that has become dirty, instead invest in upstream conservation of the watershed. And in that way, for a lower cost, you can keep that beautiful water clean and pure and safe for drinking. So the water company said, we'll give that a try. And so for almost an embarrassingly small amount of money, TNC coughed up some money, the water company provided some money, we went upstream to change some ranching and farming practices. The intervention was very simple. It actually was in the farmers and ranchers' best interest, but we helped them keep their cattle away from the river. We put plantings along the riverside to keep uh, soil and dirt from falling into the river, sedimentation. We improved ditching so fertilizer didn't inadvertently run into the river. These kinds of interventions. And the Nature Conservancy knows how to do that. And it worked. So then we recruited the Coca-Cola franchiser and the beer company to join forces. And then ultimately, the rules were changed so that every user of water in Quito paid a small fee for upstream conservation. Now, they would have paid a higher fee if the plant and equipment had been built, because that would have been more expensive but instead they're paying a fee for upstream conservation. By the way, the watershed upstream, it's the Condor Bioreserve of Ecuador. We would have wanted to protect it just for conservation's sake, for a we love nature perspective. But this time, instead, we were investing in that watershed because that was the infrastructure that kept water clean. So it was around this time that I showed up at the Nature Conservancy. Again, I have a financial background. Uh, the economy was weak. We had the financial crisis. I was concerned about where will the Nature Conservancy raise all the money it, it needs. And I learned about this project, and I said, wow, this is almost too good to be true. Number one, it's conservation that pays for itself. A small amount of philanthropic capital up front kind of got the flywheel turning. And if we don't mess this up, this conservation program ought to continue in perpetuity. Users of water paying to protect nature in order to secure clean water, but getting a whole bunch of co-benefits that come from protecting nature. That's the first breakthrough. Second breakthrough, it's kind of an aha moment for um, the citizens of Quito. Remember, I started, my premise is we need more people on the side of environmentalists. Well, now the citizens of Quito, everyone, business and individuals, paying for water, came to understand that this was a lower cost, practical way to secure their clean water. Third, it changed our dialogue. Notice the, the TNC in this case, we didn't show up and criticize anyone. We didn't show up and find fault with their practices. We didn't criticize anyone's ide ideology. Rather, we rolled up our sleeves and said, let's solve a problem in a practical, cost-effective way. Really changed the dynamic between the environmental community and everybody else in Quito. And then finally, we said, if this is such a good idea, we ought to be able to replicate it, right? And so we raised a little bit more money from the Coca-Cola uh, bottling company, FEMSA, that covers Latin America, and from the Inter-American Development Bank. 
and from TNC. We raised a rather small amount of money, and that's leading. We'll soon have 25 of these water funds across Latin America, each a variation of the same theme. Downstream users of water paying to protect nature to secure clean water. For example, in another instance, it's a group of Colombian sugarcane growers. I've met these sugarcane growers. They're nobody's idea of tree huggers or environmentalists. They would not have received well a lecture by me about how they shouldn't change their environmental practices. They would have laughed us out of the room. But they were interested in securing the clean water they, they needed at the lowest cost. Today, the water funds are rather small, but now we're, taking it, we're going to take it to a bigger scale. The booming city of Sao Paulo, Brazil, depends on the Atlantic forest for its water. The Atlantic forest was once one of the hemisphere's great forests, sadly degraded. We're now arg arguing to the water authority in Sao Paulo, if we just shift some of the money they already invest in plant and equipment to secure the clean water they'll need for their booming population, if we just shift some of that to protecting the watershed, they'll save money and we'll have an opportunity to restore this great ecosystem. That's what I mean about natural capital. A new way to talk to people, a new way to broaden support for conservation, a new way to raise funds to take our work to scale. But you might say, well, fine, that's a nice Latin American example. What about something closer to home? Here's my second example. Now I'm going to go back in time not so long to 2008. We're in the grips of the financial crisis. You'll remember President Obama um, executed the stimulus plan that uh, was first planned by President Bush's administration. You'll remember the administration was looking for shovel-ready jobs. That's the phrase they, they uh, used. TNC knocked on the doors on Capitol Hill and said, boy, have we got a shovel-ready job for you. We raised some money to, re to build oyster reefs in the Gulf. The Gulf's ecosystem's in bad shape. They've lost a lot of their oyster reefs. And what we were able to demonstrate very, very fully, very persuasively, with all the analytics and evidence you need, is that for $1 million, we can build one mile of oyster reef. Now, the Gulf needs seawalls to reduce erosion and to provide protection against storms. There's nobody disputes that the Gulf needs seawalls. What we were able to demonstrate is you can build a seawall two ways, simply put. You can build an old-fashioned man-made seawall. It costs about the same amount of money, a million dollars for a mile. Or you can build an oyster reef seawall. Now let's compare them. The man-made seawall gets the job done, but like all man-made uh, gray infrastructure, it depreciates over time. It's not anybody's fault. That's just the nature of man-made things. Now take my oyster reef. I, my oyster reef will at least hold its value. It might even appreciate over time. So it has an economic advantage right off the bat. But of course, the oyster reef just doesn't provide protection from storms and reduce ero erosion. The oyster reef is an oyster reef. It brings back oysters. Oysters are prized by the Gulf communities for all the economic benefits that the oyster business provides. Plus, oysters clean water. Plus, oyster shells ultimately crumble. And those shells are washed into the shore, and they nourish the beach. Plus, those oyster reefs provide habitat for birds and fish, another boom to the local economy. Now, you might say, well, that's an interesting anecdotal example. But now, now fast forward to today. One of the great environmental wins last year was passage of the Restore Act. The Nature Conservancy is very proud of its role. But again, we did this in concert with all the important US-based environmental organizations. We argued to the Congress that the BP oil fines should largely be reinvested. Those monies should be reinvested in restoring the Gulf's ecosystem. And we prevailed. That's where the money's going to go. And now, as government officials think about where that money will be invested, and they think about the need for protection for, against storms and beach erosion, we've got great evidence that you can invest in oyster reefs, not man-made seawalls, and get this win-win-win outcome. That's what I mean about natural capital. And then one final example, and this is close to home and very recent, Hurricane Sandy. You know, an environmentalist uh, like me, I should be very careful. I don't want to be glib about saying there's a silver lining sometimes in this bad news. Hurricane Sandy was devastating. I'm a New Yorker. Uh, it, was, it was very, very difficult and continues to be difficult for New York communities, especially coastal communities. But it did wake people up. It did get at least the attention of New Yorkers, and, uh, and New Yorkers' attention can go a long way. Um, but what's very interesting about Hurricane Sandy is there's a coastal community, some of you may know it in New Jersey, called Cape May. It's a somewhat well-to-do coastal community. Uh, beautiful Victorian homes, quite close to the shore. 
So the residents of Cape May were already concerned, pre-Sandy, about risk from storms and sea level rise. And so together with the Nature Conservancy, we restored some dunes and some wetlands in Cape May. The idea was to protect against storms and floods. Now we weren't thinking so much of a Hurricane Sandy level storm, but that's what came. And guess what happened? The community of, of Cape May suffered much less damage and much less flooding, flooding than neighboring communities. So we think we now have great evidence, again, of investing in nature, getting very tangible things that people really want as outcomes. Now we've got some more studying to do, because we've got to make that case on an ironclad basis. Now I could go on and on with example after example in fisheries, in agriculture, in urban settings, and that's exactly what I do in my book. So if you're interested, uh, I hope you'll take a look. But what's common in each of these cases are a couple of things. First of all, um, we're broadening support for the environmental movement. We're talking to folks about solving problems that they don't think of themselves as environmentalists, but they do want to solve problems in a practical way. Second, we're raising additional financial resources. Resources we really need to take the environment up to an environmental movement up to another level so that we can have a bigger impact, an impact that will really be important to achieve. And then very importantly, and I didn't know this, I didn't really think about this until recently, but I think it, it changes the nature of the dialogue between environmentalists and the rest of society. And I think that's very important. You see this all over um, society in modern times. I now live in D.C. I moved to D.C. for this job. And, you know, it, it kind of saddens me when you watch the political discourse. They're, everybody is so quick to find fault with the other side and vilify the other side. And sometimes we environmentalists make that mistake. And I think we're losing a lot of society, therefore. They don't want to be part of a food fight. They don't want to, it, it, it doesn't look attractive. But when we think and talk in these terms of natural capital, we get out of finding blame. We spend less time criticizing, and rather we think about how to build alliances to solve important problems, to make humans' lives better. These are the kinds of things that I get excited about natural capital. Now there's one last example I want to put on the table in the spirit of kind of full disclosure. Um, of course, my background is in the private sector. You know, but you, you might wonder, how, how the heck did you become an environmentalist? I also grew up in the city of Cleveland, right in the middle of the city. So I don't have a very representative environmentalist background. I didn't grow up in the great outdoors, and I, and I did professionally grow up as a business person. But as a parent, um, I became very interested in getting, I'm co probably to compensate for my own uh, uh, childhood, my wife and I made a real effort to get our kids outdoors. And that's when I really began to appreciate the wonders of nature. And I became familiar with the challenges to nature. And at the time, I was a business person, and uh, some people might think this is naive, but I, I really don't think so. I, I believe, and I still believe, properly harnessed and properly regulated, business can be a powerful force for good. You know, we only, I mean, let's face it, what, uh, we, have, we only have so many things going for us. Uh, you know, in modern times, capitalism has been pretty successful. If we can harness capitalism to be good, I think it's really important that we try to do that. And so as the leader of TNC, I'm very interested in finding alliances with the private sector that can make a very big difference. So one of those alliances that we're pursuing, and I wrote a whole chapter about this in the book, is with Dow Chemical. Now when we first began to work with Dow Chemical, I can't tell you how many people would come up to me shaking their head and say, Mark, come on, why would you ever work with Dow Chemical? And they said that for reasonable uh, considerations. They were aware that Dow Chemical's environmental track record has always not been so stellar. And they were aware of, it, of Dow Chemical's enormous environmental footprint. But I always responded the same way. I always said, that's exactly why I want to work with Dow Chemical. If we can change, if we can show the business community that we can change the behavior of companies like Dow Chemical so that their environmental impact is reduced in, and do it in a way that is better for their business bottom line, that's something that we can really scale up. So Andrew Liveris is the CEO of Dow Chemical. He's someone I know very well and I respect very much. I think he's a great business leader. And he understands these arguments that I'm making. And he heard me talk about natural capital. And so he challenged me. He said, Mark, if you're right, if you're right about this, then Dow Chemical must be dependent on natural capital or green infrastructure. Why don't we do a project together? Why don't your scientists and my engineers figure out precisely how dependent Dow is on natural capital, whether that natural capital is vulnerable, and by the way, it always is, and if so, then what Dow might do about it. So that's how our project arose. And then it's very interesting how it's moved forward. So I put together a team of our best scientists. We get that there's a lot of risk here. 
we get that we have to execute really well. So I took some of our, my best scientists. Andrew took some of his best engineers. We sent them to Freeport, Texas, where Dow's biggest facility is, their biggest facility in the whole world. They went down to brainstorm about how this project might work. Again, guess what happened? My scientists came back and they said, you know, Mark, we don't want to work on this project. We don't like those Dow engineers. They don't speak our language. They don't see the world the way we do. They don't care about the things that we care about. And Andrew Livers called me and he goes, hey, Mark, my, my engineers don't want to work with you guys. They don't see the world the way you do. They don't care about the same things. And we both sort of said, exactly. You know, um, you know, some people say about this natural capital idea that I'm talking about now, they say, Mark, that's not a new idea. They're exactly right. It's not new as an idea or as a theory. But what is exciting to me is we're taking it now from theory and we're, we're making it actionable. So a couple of examples from the Dow project, and then I will wrap up. Uh, one of the concerns Dow has, it's again, storms and extreme weather. Um, the Freeport uh, facility is right on the coast, and of course, therefore, they're very worried about sea level rise and storms again. And so you can be sure the Dow engineers were, are ready to go when it comes to seawalls. You know, engineers, they like that kind of infrastructure. They understand it fully. They know exactly what they'll get if they invest in a man-made seawall. They know the pros and cons, the lifetimes. They know what it will do and what it won't do. So we environmentalists, we like to, we like to really preach. We like to preach about the wonders of investing in green infrastructure, but that's insufficient for an engineer. An inv engineer can't make a big and important investment on the basis of theory. He needs concrete evidence. So that's what's happening in that Dow project. Our scientists, their engineers, are trying to translate our environmental ideas into cash flow statements, business plans, uh, risk profiles, so that that engineer can know as much about the green alternative as the gray one. I think that's really an important breakthrough. Some folks scratch their head, they say it's such like a boring kind of project. Well, it might be boring, and it might not be headline grabbing, but in my view, this is a fundamental breakthrough for the environmental movement, to, to, to take our dialogue that much further. So again, I think you'll see natural capital, more, more financial resources, different kinds of supporters, engineers from Dow, and a different way of speaking about our business. There's one more thing that came out of Dow. We definitely didn't anticipate this, but it turns out Dow wants to expand that particular plant. There are a lot of things happening in the Dow project, and we're disclosing it all as we go. But because they want to expand the, expand the plant, they're required to install new scrubbers in their chimneys. There's nothing wrong with that, but our team of scientists observed, hey, you might be able to achieve the same local pollution reduction benefit by planting trees. And so the EPA, we have a little bit more work to do with the regulators, but the EPA is indicating they'll approve this. So rather than invest in new scrubbers, Dow will invest in new trees. There'll be trees up and down the Brazos River, really important. The Brazos River, as all water sources in Texas, are under great threat. And tree plantings won't only help on local pollution, they'll, they'll improve the health of the river. It might also be possible, we're doing the work now due to wind patterns, it might be possible to achieve some of that benefit by planting trees in Houston. This really excites me because I want, I want to show urban residents that conservation matters in cities too. I wrote a chapter about that. But I don't know, some of you will be familiar with Houston. It's a perfectly fine city, but we can all agree it could use some more trees. <laughs> That's going to be especially true in the future because climate's changing. It's going to get warmer and warmer in Houston. And so these are the kind of breakthroughs we're happening, we're, we're achieving. Okay, now let me wrap up. So back to Russell Train. If I had been a little quicker on my feet, that's the way I would have answered him. I would have said, you know, Mr. Train, with all due respect, it's not such a bad thing, in my view, to have an investment banker leading an environmental organization and therefore in a position to advocate for investments in nature. It's not to say that it's the only strategy. It's not. We're very humble about that. It's just one important strategy. But it's, it's important because, again, it can bring us more supporters, it can bring us more financial resources, and it can improve the dialogue between environmentalists and everyone else. But I would also hasten to say to Mr. Train, and I will say to you, I know that it's, all, it's not all about dollars and cents either. Environmentalists love nature. We want to, we want to um, uh, turn over to our kids and our grandkids an ecosystem that's as healthy as the one we've enjoyed. That's our moral obligation. And that, of course, trumps all other motives. Some people say, sometimes say to me, well, what can I do about it? Well, there's so much you can do. Let's just think about who you are and what you can do. First of all, you're all citizens and voters. Well, I get excited about our volunteer initiatives with the private sector, but what's much more necessary ultimately is an enlightened government that does the right thing in a practical way to be sure, in a way that provides society what it needs on a cost-effective basis to be sure, 
but your voters and citizens. So please, to the fullest extent, engage if you care about nature and protecting nature for your descendants. You're also, many of you, business leaders or investors or shareholders. Please use your clout, therefore, to encourage and push and motivate the private sector to do what it can, because there's so much it can do. I think we've just begun to scratch the surface. And of course, your family members. Some of you are parents. Some of you might even be grandparents. Uh, do what you can uh, to inculcate in your families profound respect and love and appreciation of nature. And, and support environmental organizations, whichever ones you prefer. Support the environmental strategies that you think are best. I'm not saying ours are the best. I think ours are worthy ones, but there are many worthy ones. But we really owe it to our children and grandchildren, a natural world as, one as, as, as healthy as the one we've inherited. At TNC, we say our job is to save the lands and water that life depends on. It's hard to be against that. I hope you'll join us in that work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mark Tursik. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. Learn more about the forum online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is Mark Tursik, President and CEO of the Nature Conservancy and author of the new book, Nature's Fortune how business and society thrive by investing in nature. We'll be taking questions from our speaker, for our speaker from the radio audience through Twitter and Facebook. Our Twitter handle is WestminsterTHF, and you can find us on Facebook at Westminster Town Hall Forum. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us for our next Town Hall Forum on Thursday evening, June 27th at 7 p.m when Episcopal Bishop Gene Robinson will be our guest speaker. Mark, Mark Tersick, if you would now return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. You referred to environmentalists, environmentalists as being preachers, so this is your chance in the pulpit. Go for it. <laughs> I want to ask you an opening question about the, an event you referred to a couple times in your remarks, that is the economic downturn. Was that good or bad for the environmental movement? Well, um, I don't, the, environment, the economic downturn is not, I don't think, good for anyone. Um, I think, um, just taking a domestic perspective, the economic challenges our country faces are great ones. Um, I think there's almost no sadder plight than unemployment. Um, I know some unemployed people, great people, and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's sad to see people um, not fully engaged and, um, and sometimes losing confidence, et cetera. So, um, from my perspective as, as an environmentalist, therefore, I think it's very important for us environmentalists to be mindful of the needs for economic progress. And so I'm most attracted to those kinds of environmental solutions that are consistent with economic progress. The good news is I think there's ample opportunity to find those, those kinds of opportunities. There's a second part of the an economic downturn that's troubling, too. We really do need a strong government and a well-funded government a lot of what's needed in the environment in the U.S., but globally, is really the purview of, of governments. And so having financially weakened governments not in our best interests either, but we somehow have to soldier through it and get past all of that. We have a question, a question that's come in from Twitter. How do we reduce the large number of environmental organizations? We have an increasing number of development folks uh, uh, who are asking about uh, un a united front on the environmental area. We have a couple questions asking that. Okay. Yeah, lots of people say to me, boy, there are too many environmental organizations. Why don't you guys just consolidate or just cooperate more? I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question. Um, most of the, of the bigger environmental organizations I know very, very well. Now, it might be we don't tell our story well, and so it might look to outside observers like we all kind of do the same thing. In fact, there's kind of an ecosystem of environmental organizations. There are a lot of roles to play. 
To the Nature Conservancy, we're a big, well-resourced organization. There are some things we are well-positioned to do very, very well. But there are other important things that we don't do, and other organizations are well-positioned to do those things. And let's face it, our challenges are enormously big and difficult. And so I think it's you know, all hands on deck. So I don't think there are too many organizations. Um, thanks. Now, I, I won't comment about those development officers, but treat them nicely. They're doing God's work. It's not that easy. Now, another thing people say is you guys should collaborate more. That's a worthy suggestion to environmental organizations. I think we're not so bad at it, better than you think. So I mentioned the Restore Act. That was really important legislation. And I promise you, all the key groups came together. And it was a diverse group. It included the, the, uh, you know, the, the sportsmen's community, the fishermen and, and, and the hunters. It included mountain bikers. It included environmentalists like this, us. It included more aggressive advocates. But we all rallied together because we knew Capitol Hill needed to hear from us in one voice. And then there's other things that we do, um, and maybe we just need to tell this story better. Some folks want us to collaborate all the time. Well, that doesn't make sense because there's a cost to collaboration. It's just like the private sector. Big businesses don't always collaborate. More meetings, it slows you down. But when collaboration can pay off, when one plus one will be more than two, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job of getting, getting our act together and figuring out how to collaborate. So what I would ask, I think we could tell our story better. Maybe we can use your time better if we really are bugging you with our development officers. But if you care about the environment, I hope you'll pay attention to lots of environmental organizations. I think most of them are pretty darn worthy. They deserve your support. And I think you'll appreciate that there are different roles for different organizations. Question about the philanthropic funds you receive. This person presumes you receive corporate funding. Uh, how can you assure us that there are no unacceptable strings attached to that kind of yeah. funding? Um, we do accept some corporate funding. I think it's about 10% of our funding right now. So it's actually not. Um, a disproportionately large amount, but it's material. And so we have very stringent guidelines about who we will work with and who we won't work with. And we've made some improvement here. It's, we've become aware that our supporters want to be assured we're being thoughtful about all that. So on our website, nature.org, you'll find, I think, very comprehensive company-by-company -company disclosure of what we do, how the money's being used. And we pay close attention to that, and our board pays close attention to it. I mentioned Andrew Livers. I mean, it starts with we need the commitment and the engagement of the CEO. Because in our view, and I really believe this, uh, it makes a load of difference whether the CEO is totally engaged and committed or otherwise. So we're very careful about who we work with, number one. And second, we disclose everything we do along the way. Uh, I told you we're doing that in Dow. A lot of folks are saying, oh, we don't like this Dow project. And I say, fine, pay attention. We're going to disclose everything we do, and if you see us making mistakes or missing something, tell us, because we'd like to know that. We don't have any hidden motives. We want to do our job as best we can. Um, the third thing I would say, though, is the exciting stuff that we want to do with the private sector isn't so dependent on funding. We don't really think of the private sector as a source of funding for the Nature Conservancy. Rather, what we want to do is help them understand doing the right thing environmentally can actually be consistent with getting the best outcome from a business perspective. That's something we think can really scale up. What about economic progress in places like China or in other areas of the developing world? They have increasingly a negative environmental impact. What role is the Nature Conservancy or other organizations playing regarding these nations? Yeah, well, we're very engaged. So the, in, the environmental movement, as practiced by organizations like ours, is, uh, especially in the developing world, we're becoming an environmental slash economic development organization, especially in poorer countries, so poorer than China. Um, if you go to see the head of state, and sometimes I get to do that, if you speak exclusively about protecting nature, that head of state is likely to conclude, I don't have time for this. But if instead the dialogue can be more like, here's how protecting nature can help you achieve your economic goals and your goals for lifting people out of poverty, that kind of message resonates. So that's, the, that's a, a central theme to a lot of our work all around the world. In China, I mean, China is very complicated. On the one hand, they've done a brilliant job of growing the economy to lift people out of poverty. And this lifting people out of poverty is significant. Sometimes I think environmentalists dismiss that. It's taking folks who really lived in very difficult circumstances, without good housing, without good nutrition, without educational alternatives for their children. Making progress on that front is pretty important. And in my view, you know, I'm for that. But now China has the complicated challenge of dealing with the environmental consequences of that. There's some reason for hope. And there's some reason where US citizens should be rather humble. 
because China might soon be outpacing us. One thing that's different about China and America is most of the Chinese leaders have science backgrounds. So they understand all these environmental issues. There's no, there's no thread in China of climate change denialism. There's no such thing. And by the way, China also understands they're far more vulnerable to the bad impacts of climate change than we are. And they're already hearing from concerned citizens who won't any longer tolerate the pollution that they face. So they have the very difficult job of balancing the need for continued economic growth with better environmental outcomes. They have some advantages that we don't have also. We're kind of a capital short country right now. I think we've had some, you know, unfortunately we've made some economic choices that make us a, a debtor country. Awkward to say that about the U.S. China's a capital rich country. It's led by scientists. They understand the high stakes here. They want their economy to mature and progress. And there's lots of evidence that they're ahead now in investing in the renewable energy space. The U.S., to be sure, has lots of advantages as well. But um, I'm counting on China. I think China's going to emerge as a really important leader here. I just hope the U.S. doesn't fall behind. If I had a magic wand, what I'd like to do is to take the Senate and the Congress to China, uh, and they could stop you know, kind of bad-mouthing China and see firsthand how things are changing. While we're on China, let's talk a moment about uh, population growth and overpopulation. To what extent is a fundamental cause of environmental issues today or negative problems today a result of overpopulation? And what are the political solutions of that? We've seen some attempt to that to, to solve that in China. What about closer to home? So we're, we're, the Nature Conservancy, you know, I always say this to my colleagues, we can't do everything. Even though we're a big nonprofit organization, we are big, but we are also still very resource constrained. That's true for all nonprofits. And so I think you've got to stick to your knitting and stick to your focus. So we're not directly in the population business. I will observe, though, that many of our conservation projects in the developing world, for example, I'm thinking right now of work we're doing in Kenya. We've done work in Kenya to improve water supply and to improve security. It has the direct and immediate consequence of young girls aren't spending their time any longer fetching water, but instead they're able to go to school. And experts tell me there's probably no better intervention to uh, address uh, population. So in our own way, as conservationists, we are addressing population. Yes, population does matter. For sure, a bigger population uh, puts more pressure on the environment. For sure, a bigger middle class does as well. Um, our hope is that we can use science to guide the blend of infrastructure that's needed for that economic growth, uh, to, get, to get what's needed for lifting people out of poverty without um, bad environmental outcomes. We're cautiously optimistic. We also hope that continued economic growth, including conservation investments, will allow for more educational opportunities for young women. That seems to be the fastest uh, way to address population. And the evidence recently is very, very encouraging. Uh, most of the long-term prognosticators on population are reducing their, their estimates, and so there's reason for encouragement. I suspect you're aware that you're in uh, an area where there's a lot of controversy about mining, and particularly in northern Minnesota, the conflict between jobs and the environment. Any comments on uh, a, a way through that, a win-win solution, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't want to come across as naive. Mining has huge environmental consequences. Um, but we do work, I mean, another of the controversial companies we work with is Rio Tinto. Um, I would say about the leading mining companies, and one is Rio Tinto, they understand, of course, that their mines have enormous economic, uh, environmental impact, and there's no getting around that. On the other hand, though, society needs what those mines produce, and it's their job to provide those minerals for, again, the economy demands that stuff. All of us have lifestyles, and all of us are consumers that require continued output from mining. So it's, it's a little bit hard to just be against mining unless we really change our lifestyle. So companies like Rio Tinto, I think in, they deserve to be encouraged, and we're doing our best, are trying to understand how you can first reduce the environmental impact of a mine, offset that environmental impact, and then upon the completion of the mining activity, reclaim that land in an environmentally sound way. There's ample evidence that that can be done, provided upfront science is included so that you plan properly. Now, there's bad actors in the sector, too, and there sometimes is, is very insufficient regulatory oversight, so this is not a black and white situation. It's quite mixed. We're working with Rio Tinto in Mongolia, one of the world's biggest mines. It's in the Gobi Desert. We believe the Gobi Desert is an important ecosystem to protect. Mongolia is a, is a, is a government that wants both 
economic growth and good environmental outcomes. So Rio's commitment is to, first of all, work with our science to locate the mine and the infrastructure in a way that minimizes environmental harm. And they have some degrees of freedom, so our science can really allow the impact to be minimized. The impact is still, though, very big. And so then Rio agrees to offset that impact. They've already had those kinds of commitments, but now they're using our science to optimize that offset. So the most important parts of the Gobi Desert's ecosystem are protected. What we really hope happens, though, is, are, is twofold. One, we want to use the example of Rio Tinto and the government of Mongolia's clout, but it's a young government and it's under enormous stress. We want to use that example to influence the other mining companies and other infrastructure players in Mongolia to make similar commitments. We're not there yet, but we're on the case. Second, we want Rio Tinto to do the same thing up across the world in all of their mines, and I think we can probably count on Rio Tinto to do that, but saying it and doing it are different things. And then with Rio Tinto's help and example and other leading companies, we want to get the mining sector broadly to sign up for a compact, if you will, to do mining on this most enlightened basis. And you might think, well, Mark, that's so naive. But it's not really naive. What's motivating these business leaders? Well, some of them, as you'd expect, are just good people who want to do the right thing. They're not different than you or me. But others of them are also making a different calculation. They understand the world's a fast-changing place. There's great transparency and sharing of information. They don't have a permanent license to operate. And they anticipate that it's going to be increasingly important for them to show in all parts of the world that you can mine with acceptable environmental outcomes. So they want to get ahead of all that. Here's what I'm sure is an entirely hypothetical question. If you worked for a very large retailer whose headquarters may or may not be located very nearby, <laughs> what specific business case would you pitch to senior leadership to prioritize improving sustainability? Well, you know, uh, the retailers deserve quite a bit of credit. So, um, hmm, who could the local company be? It boggles the mind. But some of the really famous, dominant, large, high-growth retailers that have huge presence across America have been real leaders in the environmental space. Um, I'll mention a company that's not headquartered nearby first, just to, um, I don't know, just, to, just, to, just to take a national perspective. Walmart, a company that's oft criticized. Let's put that aside for a minute. Um, in, you know, Walmart, it's very interesting in Walmart's history. It went from being one of America's most respected companies and very quickly became one of America's least respected companies. Nothing's permanent in this space, and, by, and business leaders get that. So Walmart's reputation suddenly fell. It had the direct impact of meaning it was harder for Walmart to get the license to operate. They were being constrained in opening new stores. Communities were saying, we don't want you. And of course, that got Walmart executives' attention. And so with those kinds of motives, maybe not necessarily environmental or green motives, they decided they needed to do something to better be a better citizen. They looked into the environmental space, and they quickly discovered enormous opportunities to um, uh, pursue environmental progress in a way that uh, improved their business. So the first things they did was improve their use of energy uh, across their stores and their transportation fleet. And the more they did with great environmental outcomes, the more money they saved, they realized. So they loved it. And these are the best kinds of initiatives, I think. They didn't need a do-good motive. They needed a business motive. And boy, they have that. Then they got into package reduction. You know, so much pack there's so much waste in packages. And so Walmart's been very aggressive in getting suppliers to be more economical with packaging, saving forests around the world. I mean, when companies like Walmart or other big retailers you might know very well, when they do something like this, it scales up fast. Then they got into supply chain management. And so Walmart, for example, is a big purchaser of beef from the Amazon. The Amazon is, is one of the ecosystems we really want to protect. There are two big threats, soy and beef. We've made a lot of progress working with companies like Cargill. There's a chapter about this in my book. I should have mentioned it, given where we are. Cargill has been a great ally of ours. Cargill was put under pressure by McDonald's due to Greenpeace protests in Europe to source soy sustainably. They worked with us, and we were able really to transform soy agriculture in Brazil, materially reducing the threat to the Amazon. Now Walmart is trying to do the same thing in sourcing its beef products. So these are the kinds of initiatives. Oh, there's one more thing Walmart did. It's a little outside our space, so I, I forgot about it. CFLs, compact fluorescent light bulbs. You'll all know that everybody has concluded compact fluorescent light bulbs are a better deal. They don't only have a better environmental outcome, they cost less over the life of the light bulb. However, they're much more expensive up front, and nobody in America was buying them. Walmart became aware of that, 
And Walmart said, fine, we're going to change this. They set some really lofty goal for compact fluorescent light bulb sales. Everybody laughed and said it could never be achieved. They made it very hard to buy old-fashioned light bulbs in Walmart. They made it very easy to buy CFLs, and boom, they achieved their target faster than they expected. Last thing I'll say about this, and I got my last job at Goldman Sachs, I was, a, I was mostly a mainstream banker. And then my last job was I was the environmental guy. And so I used to give speeches sort of like this, to business leaders saying, um, you ought to have an environmental strategy. I promise you there's things you can do. And a lot of them would react, well, sure, you work at, at Goldman Sachs. It's easy for Goldman Sachs to have an environmental strategy that would make business sense. But what could I ever do? And I, I, I bet all these companies, I guarantee if we spend a few hours and brainstorm a little bit about how your business intersects with the nature, we'll find ways for your business to become a better steward of the environment and in a way that improves your business. I think it's not just retailers, therefore, it's everybody. We have time for just one more brief question. How do you move from environmental movement to societal norms? Are you hopeful we're making that move? Yeah, I am. I mean, it's really important. Um, it's, it's kind of sad, actually. If you, um, if you wanted to be kind of a tough critic of the environmental movement, you could say, well, let's just see what kind of legislative breakthroughs uh, you guys have achieved. Because at the end of the day, we need good regulatory oversight in these environmental matters. Thank you. Okay, well, here's the answer. The last big breakthroughs were things like the formation of the EPA, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act. Who was president when we did all that stuff? President Nixon. It's a long time ago. I was alive, but I was pretty young. Um, we we've, we've somehow have to restore broad, bipartisan, toned-down, friendly, fact-based discussion of these environmental issues. Thank you. Listen. I'm getting, I'm getting the hook. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank, Thank you, Mark Tursek. <laughs>